Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. Whether you're outdoor in the courtyard, online, or in our Discovery Northwest campus, we're excited that you're here. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on. We're in part two of this series called Dream to Destiny. Here's what I know. Absolutely. You have a dream from God. God created you on purpose, but he created you as well for a purpose. You have a dream and you have a destiny. Many people live with the dream, but never in the destiny. This series, we're going to be going through the life of Joseph, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, found in Genesis chapter 37 is where we're at for the next few weeks. Uh, This series is going to take us all the way into summer, June and July. I hope you guys love your Bible. How many of you love your Bible out there? Amen? Okay, fine. I love my Bible. The 10 of you, I'm I'm sure Northwest was screaming right now, all right? They love their Bible at Northwest, okay? No, I'm just kidding. So here's Joseph. Joseph, he begins this story, you remember, at age 17, and God gives him a dream for his life, but because he's just not mature, he interprets that dream very selfishly through the immaturity and his lack of character, and and, and he misuses the dream. He, he actually ends up at 30 years old stepping into his destiny, but he doesn't fulfill it for many years later. In fact, some of the, some of the study we're going to go through, because uh, I got 10 character tests, 10 tests that God took Joseph through to achieve his destiny. Some of the tests that Joseph took were after he stepped into his destiny. How I many of you know it doesn't stop? You never stop growing. God never stopped testing you. And, and maybe you don't even like that language or that idea that God is testing you. But you need to wake up to the reality. God is growing you up. God wants to build you up and mature you up. And the way he does that is through these trials and testing. And it's not even that we're going through stuff. It's how you respond to this stuff. So what we need to do is pass the test in order to go to the next level of grace. The next level of, uh, of faith. Now, last week, we, we studied the first test. And I told you Joseph failed. He failed that test. And it was the pride test. Okay, young man, very prideful, boasted about who he was and his father's love for him and the dream that he had. Today, we're going to talk about the pit test. Someone say the pit test. All right. Y'all know what a pit is, right? When you find yourself in a pit. Let me give you a working definition today. Because we're going to see Joseph's pit. Let me give you a working definition of a pit. A pit is this. It's any difficult situation that leaves us feeling helpless and hopeless as though there is no means of escape. Anyone ever been in a pit before like that? Where you feel like there's no way out. It feels even hopeless and helpless. Let me tell you something. When you're in that situation, you need to know this. That is a test from God. All right, that is not an accident. It isn't, it isn't just persecution or the spiritual warfare, all these other things. Maybe that's included, but what you need to know is that that is a test from God. Maybe today you find yourself in a financial pit. You don't know how to get out. You feel helpless and hopeless about your finances. Don't know how to get out of the debt that you're in. Maybe you're in a career pit or maybe your relationship is in a pit. You feel hopeless about a relationship We could end up in a health pit or an addiction pit or a very familiar pit that I see people get into is a spiritual pit where we just feel like we're in this rut, helpless and hopeless. We're going to study Joseph's pit and how he had to pass this test in Genesis chapter 37. Let's take a look at it. Genesis chapter 37. How many of you guys brought your Bibles? Did you bring your Bible? Okay. So, So here's what I want you to do in this series. Bring your Bibles. Okay. If you don't have a Bible, get a Bible, all right, and bring your Bible, because we're going to be studying the Word of God. I cannot stress to you the importance of the, the most important thing that you can develop as a child of God is a love for His Word, to read, study, and know His Word. All right? But look, I, I, I'm not a reader, and I never was a reader. I was a C-minus student at best, you guys. But when the Lord saved me, I fell in love with his word. And this was the first thing I enjoyed we, reading was, was his word. And, and that actually changed my heart towards books in general and education in general. Now I, I love it, but I can't, tell, I can't stress you the importance that you need to know this. You need to get your nose in it and your heart in it yourself. You getting a weekly dose from me is not enough. It's not enough. 
you need to get into the Word. So I want you to bring your Bible. We're going to open that up. You're going to mark it up. We're in Genesis chapter 37. We're going to begin at verse 13. It says, And Israel said to Joseph, Israel remember two names for his father, Jacob and Israel. God did that at times where he would have an encounter. He would meet somebody and then change their name and redefine them according to who he sees them as. And so his name is, is interchangeable through the Bible. Jacob or, or Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And Joseph said, well, here I am, dad. So he said to him, come, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. And he came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. I think that's funny that Joseph is just like out there wandering. It doesn't say that Joseph found this man looking for his brothers. It just said Joseph was like out there wandering in a field. We know that Joseph was a dreamer. I believe Joseph was a daydreamer, okay? He's just, he's just out there wandering around, getting lost. And look what it says that this guy, it says that he's wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, what are you doing? You look lost, kid. What are you seeking? Well, you're out here in nowhere. Are you in trouble? You're going to starve to death or something. And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar off, and before he came near to them, they conspired. They came up with a plan. They concocted this, this plan. Look at this. They conspired against him to kill him. These are his brothers, you guys. This wasn't just normal, chaotic family dysfunction. There was deep-rooted pain and hurt in these brothers, in these siblings, in this family to get to this place where we to I told you last week, the word of God says that they hated Joseph. They couldn't speak a kind word to him. But now it's to a point that we see a whole different level. There are some deep wounds and pains that, that maybe the word of God doesn't even tell us what's going on, but just gives us some of the outcome of the dysfunction of their sibling rivalry that they conspired to kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We're talking about the pit test today. Then we will say, here's their, their plan. A fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what becomes of his dreams. We'll see what's going to become of that dreamer, like we're ever going to serve him and bow down to him. What, this is what we're going to do. Throw him in that pit. And when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. Verse 22, and Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore that his father gave him as a gift. And they took him and threw him into the pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. Joseph finds himself in deep trouble. He is in a situation that seems is helpless and hopeless. His brothers want to kill him. Doesn't seem like there's a way out of this situation. It reminds me of this, this story. I heard the story of this man who was, his car broke down or something. He had to like travel through a cemetery though to get home. And it was really late. It was like after midnight kind of late. So you know nothing's good is going to happen in this story. He's going through a cemetery. So he's going through the cemetery and he falls into an open grave that was dug. And, and he falls in, he hits the sides, twists his ankle, and he's freaking out down there, man. It's dark. He's clawing at the jumping and trying to do parkour up the wall. Nothing's working, man. He can't get out of this thing. He's at this for like 45 minutes, and finally he's just so tired. He's just like, okay, my screaming's not helping. No one's here. I am not getting out of this pit. I'm just going to calm down. Someone will come eventually. They'll hear me, maybe morning time, conserve energy, just you know, and, and so it was about 30 minutes later, this drunk was going through the cemetery and, and he falls into the same pit that that guy was in. And this, this drunk dude is freaking out at the bottom of the pit. He's screaming, help, help, and he's clawing at stuff, trying to jump up. And, and, and in about like 15, 20 minutes, he gets tired. He's, he kind of stops for a breather and then he feels a hand on his shoulder. And he heard a voice say, hey, you ain't ever getting out of here. But he did in two seconds flat. <laughs> Moral of the story, you can get out of a pit if you're properly motivated. Okay? So, 
we're going to talk about how, how, how to get out of the pit today. You might find yourself in a pit today, one of those various pits, or maybe you find yourself in a cycle or a pattern of getting into the same pits, okay? Remember, when you don't pass the test, God won't fail you. He'll bring the test back around again for you to pass it. So you might have a cyclical pattern. You look back in your life and you see a pattern of you falling into the same pits. You know what that is? That's, that's God giving you another opportunity to pass. You can grow up to be who God has called you to be. So, so we're going to talk about how we, how we get out of the pit, but I actually need to show you how you got into it in the first place. We all, go, we all get into pits. You all know that, right? We all get into the, this, these dark moments of our life, okay? John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me, but here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. No matter how righteous you are, holy you are, doesn't matter if you're an apostle, you're running with the crew of Jesus, don't matter. You are going to have many trials and sorrows, yet there is a peace in the midst of that. And here's what he said, but take heart because I've overcame the world. Here, Jesus is saying, look, I know you're going to go through pits. I know you're going to go through trials. I know you're going to go through sorrows, but I have a peace that will protect your heart in the middle of it. So how do we, how do we end up though in, in this pit? If you're in a pit today or you have cycles of pits, how do, what happens Let's diagnose this together. How did we get here? And we'll look at it from Joseph's perspective as well. I think it's a few different ways we end up in a pit. Take some notes with me. Number one is this. I, we, fall, we can fall into a pit, okay? We can fall. And like we, not like it's an accident. Like, oh, man, I just, I just fell into addiction. No, 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 no. Here's, here's what happened. You were dancing around the edge for too long. You were going in the wrong direction. You were trying to see how close you can get to the edge of that thing. It was our, we were going the wrong direction, messing around with the wrong people in the wrong places, and that, that's what got you into the pit. It's our own foolish choices. It's, our, it's our, our engaging in sinful habits. We can be overtaken by an addiction, or for some of us, it's our uncontrolled tongue that gets us into some pits in our life. We fall into that pit, but it's not like it came out of nowhere. It's where your feet were stepping. It's where it's, it, was, it was the direction your life was headed. Chances are when you look back on your life and you look at the different pits that we have, most of the pits that you were in were dug by yourself. Let's be honest. Most of the pits we fell in, I dug it myself. I fell into that thing. I was going that direction. I was getting too close to that thing. We fall into it. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, there's a way of life that looks harmless enough. That looks, I mean, I can get out of that. that. That hole don't look too bad. That pit don't look too bad. I can jump out of that. That wouldn't hurt me. You know, I'm strong. You know, I can handle. I can handle that. There's a way that looks harmless enough, but look again, it leads straight to the pit of hell. Okay? So, so we find ourselves in pits because we fall in to them. The choices we're making. The things we're engaged with. The second reason we end up in a pit is we can actually get pushed into it. This is where some of you would say, like, look, I didn't make the choice. Someone, they attacked me. They were coming after me. It was their, it was their choices, man. Maybe a friend stabbed you in the back. Someone betrayed your, your confidence. A, a jealous or vindictive person starts spreading lies or false rumors. Or your spouse cheats on you or you catch them in pornography or something. And you're going like, I didn't choose this pit. I'm suffering from the choices of somebody else have made and it's affecting my life. I'm in this hole because somebody else pushed me to this place. An employer keeps overlooking you. You're the one who's doing all the work. You're staying late. You're putting in the hours. And everybody else is getting the promotion. You're like, this isn't fair. I feel like someone is pushing me to this place. Psalm 88, David talked to God this way. He said, God, you made my friends to loathe me. And they've actually gone away. Look what he says. I'm in a trap. And I feel like there's no way out of this thing. Like, God, I didn't do this myself. Those friends left me. I'm trapped now by this. We can get pushed into a pit. We can fall into a pit from our own decisions. But maybe the last one I'd like to uncover with us is that maybe you were born into a pit. Maybe you come from a dysfunctional home where chaos reigned. That was my home. I don't know about you. I was born 
into a bit. Joseph's story reads like an episode of Cops. Remember Cops show? You got it's like one of his brothers is a rapist. Some of them are murderers. I mean, they're trying to murder and and and, and uh, his Joseph himself throwing him into this pit. Even Jacob's own father neglected to protect Joseph against the dysfunction being tormented by his brothers. I don't know if that describes your life where you feel like chaos reigned in your home. And even today, maybe like, you know, you've been away from your home for years, but you still bear the mental scars and the emotional scars of your chaotic home. And you feel like you were just born, like you didn't choose that. This was, this was your, I was your uncle who did that. I was your parents. I was your siblings. So no matter if you fall into a pit of your own accord or get pushed into a pit by the actions of others or were born into a pit of chaos, the point is this. How you respond to the pits of life will reveal the depth of your character and integrity. A pit will either make you or break you. It will either make you bitter or it will make you better. Now, I dedicate this message to anyone today who has believed the lie that there is no way out. This message is for you, okay? Like, like God designed the service for you. Psalm chapter 34 says this, the Lord is near. He's not far away. In fact, I'll say this to you. He's nearer. The Bible says he is close to the brokenhearted. He is near to those who are discouraged. That gets God's attention when you make some bad choices and bad decisions you end up in a pit it's not like God's turning his back and running from you he's actually running towards your pit he's running towards your life he is drawn towards you he sees those who have lost all hope if you've lost hope this message is for you if you feel like you're in a cycle of helpless hopeless situation that there's no way out I'm telling you first Corinthians 10 says All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. Can I get an amen, somebody? He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you get through it. And I'm here to tell you, you can get through this. You can get out of that pit. You can get out of that situation. You can come up out of this thing. And I'm not hyping you up. This is the word of God here. This is God's word, and it's true. And I don't care what you've done or what's been done to you, maybe in the past or or listen, you have not gone past the point of no return. Because in Christ, there is no point of no return for the God who raises the dead and, and brings the dead things back to life. It's never too far, and it's never too late. Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I said. You don't know the mistakes. I've. No, 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 listen to me. You're never too far gone, and it's never too late ever. So what do we need to do to get out of that pit write these down because today we got to pass the pit test if you're in a cycle of going through these same things or today you even find yourself in that hopeless or helpless situation it's a test and i'm gonna give it to you how to pass how do you pass the test number one you have to accept personal responsibility we have to accept personal in other words what brought you to this position what got you here What led to this? How do you find yourself where you're at today? It's a wise thing when we are in a pit to examine how we have contributed to the circumstances we find ourselves in. I'm not talking about beating yourself up or anything. I'm talking about doing some soul searching, praying that prayer of David. Search me, O Lord, and know my wicked thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. Joseph could have easily assumed that it was not his fault. Like he did nothing to deserve the treatment of his brothers. That's not the way I carried myself. It's not the way I spoke to them. It's not the way I I told them my dream. It wasn't my posture to them. It wasn't the pride in me. It was the envy in them. And that's what many people do when we get in difficult times. We blame somebody else. Listen to me, guys. I am so sorry for what your parents did to you, but you need to get over it. I am so sorry about the pain that you experienced in your past, but you need to get over it. You're a 40-year-old man. Time to do something with your life. Okay? Time to do something for God. And I'm not minimizing what you've been through, but I'm telling you, you got to pass this test. You can't stay here. You can't keep blaming people. You can't keep pointing the finger at everybody else. Too often, we allow the past circumstances to determine future outcome. And the only power that the past has over your future is the power you give it, the power you surrender to it. 
we look for some other reason why we're in the pit, why our marriage is suffering the way it is. And I'll tell you, Pastor, it's her. It's her. It's her fault. It's his fault. That's why I'm suffering. It's all them. And we look for the bad guy. Or if we're suffering financially, it's got to be. I mean, it's because my job and I'm not getting paid enough. If I only made a little bit more, if I could, if I could actually do that, sure. It, no, it's, it has nothing to do with your lack of stewardship, that you have no budget and you're spending more every month than you bring in and you're piling on your debt. It has nothing to do with your own. Come on, you got to wake up and take some personal responsibility. And it's not just the envy in the brothers, but also pride within Joseph that led him to that pit. See, when we go through a difficult time, we've got to refuse the temptation to find the bad guy, to, to pass the buck and to blame somebody else or something else. Joseph's brothers hated him. They hated him. Yeah, but, but what did Joseph do to cause that? Did he contribute to that? In fact, think about this. Why wasn't Joseph tending the flock of sheep with his brothers in the first place? Why was he there? Oh, he's 17 years old. No, we see David was 17 years old, and he was by himself tending the sheep while his brothers older were at home. So no, he was well past the age to be able to contribute to the responsibilities of the home and not allow his brother. Why wasn't he even there in the first place? I researched this. Most scholars believe that there was such animosity between Joseph and his brothers that Jacob had to separate them for fear that they were going to hurt him, beat him up, or do what they did. When Jacob asked Joseph, go check on your brothers, think about that. Why did he ask him? His older brothers are 20, 30. Some of them are in there 40 years old. They don't need his help, 17-year-old kid. Why did Jacob, was it possibly that, that, that Jacob was trying to reconnect their relationship? Was it possible that he was like, kid, you need to get out of the house. Come on now. Go, go help. Go do something. Go help your brothers, okay? Could it be that, that he was trying to have them restore their relationship? And then on the way, remember, how did they know? How did they know that it was him coming? Let's look at it. Joseph, in Genesis chapter 37, it says, Now when they saw him, his brother saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they had time here. They conspired. They concocted a plan. Right, what are we going to do? Are we going to prank him? What are we going to prank And then just escalated probably to like, let's kill him. We're going to kill him, okay? So they had time to develop the plan to conspire against him to kill him. Now how did they know it was him? It was that dang coat he was wearing all the time. That coat of many colors that day, he wore it everywhere so proudly, man. He wore it in Bakersfield in July, man. He like, look at it. Uh, his dad's like, go check on him. He's like, I know the outfit. Perfect outfit to go check on my brothers. Come on now. Look how much my daddy loves me, okay? Flaunting it. He was, it was pride, man. That's what, that's what caused it. Joseph, he, when you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you should be asking yourself, what is this speaking to me? Because there's a lot of shadows and types in the Old Testament. God, what are you saying to me? through this. Here's what I want you to see. Joseph had his father's favor on him. Guess what? You have your father's favor on you. You have the grace of God on you, the favor of God on your life. Joseph's father gave him a gift. Guess what? Your father has given you a gift. He's given you blessing. But Joseph was proud of his gift. He showed it off. How many believers are proud of the gifts and the blessings that God has given them? See, we need to realize that the giver is so much better than the gift. We need to fall in love with the giver and not the gift. Some people, when you're talking to them, they try to slip in their coat. You talk to them for a little bit, they slip in how proud they are of, of something. Uh, maybe just a little while after talking to them, and they, they tell you about how much money they make. A little while after talking to them, they slip in what position they have. A little while after talking to them, they just kind of, what car they drive, their education or their status, they slip in their coat in the conversation real quick, flaunting the coat that God has given them, the blessing and the favor that God has given. Sometimes we flaunt our spiritual gifts. I've had a few come to me, they're like, hey, Pastor, I'm a prophet. I want to say, I'm a prophet too, and I knew that before you said it. But... 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says that prophecy is given to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. Why you got to flaunt your coat? Why not just show me your gift? Why not just comfort me? Why not just encourage me, okay? Why, you, why, don't, why don't you just show me your gift and not your coat? Why don't, you just show, why, don't you, why don't you stop showing your coat and just start doing the gift? Just start doing Just start being a blessing. 
being, being who God has called you to be. And this, this pride, this insecurity that goes Joseph in trouble is what gets us in trouble. Now listen carefully here. I'm about to tell you something that's strong, but you need to hear this, you guys. Um, Joseph, he, his, he had a gift from his father, just like we have gifts from our father, but his pride, because of his pride and because of his arrogance, listen carefully, he lost his gift. Now some of you are like, wait, 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 wait a second. I know Romans chapter 14 says that, or 11 says that the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Like, so I, I hear you. I know that verse. Let me, two things I need to say about that verse. Number one, that's not talking about you. It's talking about the Jewish people. Read, read Romans 11. That's talking about Jewish people. Number two, if you do want to apply that to yourself, that analogy, I'm okay with that, that God's not going to take the gift back because I didn't say that the father, Joseph's father, took his gift back. I said he lost it. We have seen so many people lose their gift, lose the blessing that God has given them because they lacked integrity. They lacked character. We see so many people lose the blessing and the favor of God, the gift that God has given them because they did not pass these character tests. Now, don't get discouraged if you're here today and you feel like that's you because remember, you're never too far and it's never too late. See, Joseph had one coat. Remember, towards the end of Joseph's story, we're going to read it and study in these 10 tests. He becomes the governor over all of Egypt, second in command of all of Egypt, the second wealthiest man in the entire known world at the time. He lost one coat, and, and I'm telling you if, if you, if you repent and respond to God in repentance, he will restore what's been taken from you a hundredfold. I believe it, he lost one coat, but I believe Joseph had a cloak closet. He had one of those buttons you press and his coat's just passing by. You know what I mean? But you got to accept the responsibility. You got to start here. How do we get out of the pit? You got to stop, stop blaming others. Here's the truth. Psalm 51 says this. David said, I've been out of step with you for a long time time. That's how I got here. That's how I got here. I've been out of step, man. That's how I fell into this thing. I shouldn't have allowed this. I shouldn't have made the decision. I should have reacted that way. I shouldn't have been around. I've been out of step with you for a long time. In fact, I've been in the wrong since before I was born. And what you're after, God, is that truth. If me to admit that, that truth from the inside out, that is accepting responsibility. Number one, if you want to get out of the pit, you got to accept responsibility. Write down number two. After you do that, number two, we have to seek God's perspective. Seek God's perspective. See, when we ask what got me in this position, we need to get God's perspective now on the pit because every time, listen to me, every time you find yourself in a pit, it's easy for it to become dark and despair and discouraged in that place. The first person that's going to show up when you get in the pit is the enemy. It's the accuser of the brethren. It is Satan and his demons to come and confuse and, and, and condemn you in the pit. How do you know if you got the perspective of the enemy or you have the perspective of God? When you're going, God, help me out of this. I take responsibility. But now you need to get the right perspective. How do you know you got the right perspective? Here it is. Here's the test. Is it condemnation or conviction? Because condemnation comes from the enemy and conviction comes from God. What's the difference? Conviction is from God, and here's what it does. It draws you to God and to God's people, into community. Condemnation does the opposite. Condemnation draws you away from God, where I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like going to group. I don't feel like reading my Bible. It draws you away, and it isolates you from God's people. That's, that's a trick of the enemy. So when you're trying to get God's perspective, what you need, you need to know this. Listen to me. God never, never, never condemns. That is not from God. God does not condemn you. I don't care what pit you found yourself in. I don't care how deep your hole is. I don't care how dark it is or how many mistakes you made or how many patterns that you've repeated in your life. God never condemns you. Those condemning thoughts are not from God. Let me back it up with theology now because some of you are looking at me like I'm a feel-good preacher or something like that. John chapter 3, 16. Very famous verse. For God so loved the world, but it's the, it's the verse right after that actually tells us that those condemning thoughts are not from God. Look what it says. For God did not, 
did not, did not, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So here's the theological reason. Listen to me why Jesus never condemns you. He does not condemn you. You know why? You're already condemned. He didn't need to come into the world condemned. You, we are already condemned. We are already in sin. We are already jacked up. Jesus came to rescue you from your condemnation. So let's make sure that the enemy isn't twisting our minds in the darkness of that pit, in the despair of our situation. I got to get God's perspective because the devil is a liar. The father of lies, he's so good at it. He's gotten so good at it. In fact, I'm going to show you in the story how good the enemy is. Let me show you how good the enemy is at telling lies. Genesis chapter 37, verse 31. They got Joseph's robe after they threw him into that pit. And they slaughtered a goat and dipped that robe in blood. And they took the ornate robe back to their father and said, notice what the brother said. They said, Dad, we found this. Examine it to see whether... It is your son, son's robe. A lot of people think they told him the lie. They didn't tell him the lie. They planted the seed. Here's, here's, here's the robe. He recognized it and said, it's my son's robe. Now watch what Jacob said of his own volition. He said, some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Was that the truth? No, that was a lie. He came to that. Here's, here's what you need to know about, the, about Satan. He's such a good and experienced liar. He will even fabricate evidence to back up his lies. He will bring to you evidence to, to further cultivate the lie and the deception. Jacob comes to his own conclusion. A lot of people think it was the brothers that told him. The brothers did it. He saw the evidence. And this is what the devil will do. He'll come to you and say, you're never going to be healed. And here's the evidence. See the report? Look at the doctor's report. You're not going to be healed. Your business ain't going to make it. Are you kidding me? Look at the annual report. You're in the hole. You're never going to get out of here. He'll come and he'll, here's a big lie he'll tell people. He'll say, you're married to the wrong person. And he'll give you evidence too. You want to know the evidence he does? He'll bring the evidence to you. Look how opposite you are. Of course you're opposite. Of course. That's what attracted you to her in the first place. Because she wasn't like you, knucklehead. You don't want to marry someone like you. You know you don't want to marry you. If you marry you, you kill yourself. <laughs> He'll give you evidence. He'll show it to you. Prove it to you. Real, factual. He'll give you evidence at work. Ooh, check this out. He'll give you evidence at work that she's the right one and evidence at home that she's not. He'll show you the evidence. Look at, look at, look at how, look how she treats you. Look at the attention he gives you. Look what he can provide for you. Look at him. He never, I'm telling you, this. he's such a good and experienced liar. He'll fabricate evidence to back up his lies. You need to get God's perspective. And I know I preach to a society that's 50% divorced, but I'll never back down from the truth of God's word, the covenant of marriage. And if you're here today and you've been divorced, hey, you're never too far and it's never too late. God does not condemn you and I don't condemn you. What you need to do is, is stop dancing around the pit though. And get God's perspective. Okay, so, so I, in order to get out of this thing, if you're here today and, and you're in a pit or you're in a cycle of a pit, and, and you know it, you see, you see the pattern, okay? How do you get out? Accept responsibility, and, and then I gotta get God's perspective. But all of that, those, those, those two steps here to get out, it's just to get us to this one. Because this here, let me give you the third one, is the purpose of the pit. It's the whole purpose of this test. Why does God put, the, put you in the pit anyway? Is number three, to cry out to God. That's the purpose, to get you to the place where you cry out to God. But you have to do the first two first, I promise you, because some of you are crying out and you're blaming other people because you haven't got the right perspective yet. So you need to take responsibility, get God's perspective, and now from that place to cry out to God. Let me say it this way. You can walk around and complain for a little bit, but eventually you're going to come to the point, to the realization that you can't get out without God, that you need God's help. In fact, you can't do anything without God. He gives you the breath you're breathing right now. Let me show you a scripture of another guy in a pit. Jonah, not in your notes, but on the screen. 
you remember jo- God called Jonah to Nineveh, and he goes to Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction. Jonah chapter 2 says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. God sent a fish to swallow him. This was a pit like you ain't ever seen, man. He was like in the belly of a fish. And he said, I cried out to the Lord. That's the purpose of the, the pit. Listen why he cried out. Because of my affliction. See, affliction can be a good thing if it causes you to cry out to God. See, that pain that you experience and that hurt and that pit and that, that what other people did and what you did to yourself, the affliction, it's, you need to get God's perspective on this, okay? Because that affliction is actually good if it gets you to this place to hit your knees and cry out to God. To cry out, that's what he did. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. Sheol is an Old Testament word, sometimes even translated the pit is what it is, a pit. I cried and you heard my voice. You've brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. I wonder if Joseph, for the first few hours in that pit, if he was like rehearsing how how bad his brothers were and how good he was, right? Just coming to check on my brothers. And here here they are, picking on me again. And and how dare they? They're so jealous of me just because dad loves me more and he treats me. And they're so, and man, God, you gave me that dream that they're going to bow down. Get them, God. Get them, God, for touching your anointed one. God, get them. And he's like, I bet at first he's like, he's like in this wrong perspective. But I bet after a little while, he's like, okay, okay, God, I I probably, I probably shouldn't have said it like that. Okay. I probably shouldn't have been boastful about what I said about them bowing down and stuff. And and okay, a little bit. It was a little bit on me. I'll take a little bit of it. Since I'm talking to you, I might as well admit a little bit of it. And I think after a few hours in that pit, you see Joseph on his knees crying out, okay, God, it's me. It's me. I did it. It's my fault I'm in this thing. It's my fault. And because something happened in the pit that changed Joseph's life forever. He comes out of this pit. We're going to talk about it next week and the weeks to come. A new man with a new level of anointing and power and gifting. Something happened in the middle of his pit, a pit that he both dug and people did it was a combination people did to him and he dug and he was born into all of those was joseph's story it might be a little bit of your story too but he came out of that pit a new man something transformative of the affliction of his pit of his despair of his darkness anytime you read the old testament i told you it's it literally happened those are sto- it literally happened, but they're types and shadows of Christ, in our, and it's for our instruction. Let me show you one of the types and shadows, beautiful type and shadow in this story, Genesis chapter 37. Let me re- I, we read this before. Let me read it to you again. Let me show you. Verse 22 says, And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Don't, ki- don't kill him. Don't hurt him like that, okay? Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Now, here's the reason why. Look what he said. That he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to the father. Now, let me tell you about Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn of Israel, the firstborn son. We're told in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, what was, what was the firstborn wants to deliver Joseph out of the pit for two reasons, to rescue him and to restore him back to the father. Check it out. The purpose of of every pit that you find yourself in, even today, is so that God would rescue you and restore you back to a deeper level of intimacy and closeness with your Father. That's the purpose. 1 Peter chapter 5 says it like this, that God opposes the proud. You're in that pit, you've been beating your chest and blaming everybody else and not taking the responsibility. Your situations, your circumstances, the people around you and what they did to you, God opposes the proud but he gives grace, favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. Can you see it? Can you see it in your mind's eye? God lifting you up out of your pit. He lifts you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 
Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.